Hello, WMC Fest. So it's so good to be here. I'm honored and really, really humbled uh, that Joseph and Jeff brought me out here to speak to you guys today. And I may or may not have been up till like 6 a.m. hanging out with the uh, Foundry Co. guys. So Travis, if you're here, uh, Doug. See, are you guys here? They make it? There they are. They're the Foundry Co. guys. Awesome. Uh, so over the last couple of years, I've been able to watch this conference grow into something I think really uh, inspiring and really, really special, something amazing and compelling, and all of you guys are part of that. Um, so Joseph, Jeff, raise your hands real quickly. These guys, when you run into them this weekend, give them a hug, give them a high five, buy them a drink. Super, super uh, special guys that have done so much work to put this conference on and put everything together. So uh, big round of applause for them. Big round of applause for the Kickstarter supporters, for all of the volunteers this weekend. Um, so as we were traveling here, uh, well first, I got this nice gift of Jesse up here. And I think WMC Fest is really special and it, it provides moments like this one from last year, which is really great. Um, so while we were road tripping from New York yesterday, uh, as you were just told, our van had like a massive blowout. It was spectacular. It was amazing. And while we were waiting for new tires, we stopped in at this place, at Leon's Fireside Cafe. And it's really mind-blowing for so many reasons. If you're ever in Pocono Springs, stop by Leon's, and Johnny will take great care of you. Amazing place. So first, a little bit about my background. Uh, after getting a BFA in design uh, in the summer of 2011, I went to London to study typographic application and theory in the typography summer school program in East London, which is a really fantastic experience. If you're really into type design and you want to spend some time uh, over summer in London, I recommend it highly. And then in the fall of 2011, I moved to New York to study at this program, the Type of Cooper program at the Cooper Union, which is a postgraduate uh, typeface design program. And that was also just an incredible experience, which I highly recommend. Um, while I was there, I made this typeface which should be out next year, so look out for that. Um, and for the past couple of years, I've been working at the collaborative workspace Studio Mates. Studio Mates, shout out, right over here. Um, in Dumbo, Brooklyn. And I've been working at the web design and development studio Oak uh, <laughs> on a range of projects from web and user interface design to packaging work to identity work and sort of everything in between. And I'm really excited to be able to have this platform today to announce that starting next month, I'll be working full time under my own name for the first time. So it's really exciting. Thanks, guys. So I tried doing this entire talk in animated GIFs at first, but it turned out to be really hard and it was a bad idea. So <laughs> I went away from it. Um, so today I want to talk to you a bit about field work. So we'll look at some basic ideas uh, from fields adjacent to design, but also completely different from design. And I think there are some really interesting lessons that we can learn that relate back to the work that we do. So I like to think of doing this field work uh, as research rather than gathering inspiration, sort of like a scientific process. I think inspiration is a really romantic notion. Um, it really sounds magical and instant, and I think design is really more of a process most of the time. And when I say that we should do research in other fields, I don't mean that designers should wear lab coats like these guys from Unimark in the 60s. Um, they tried that and it didn't work out so well. You can see they look so thrilled about it. So the specific areas that we'll look at today are five, uh, five different areas. Architecture, filmmaking, food, anthropology, and music. And these are areas that I'm personally curious about, um, but I also think that they're varied enough to provide some unique perspectives on our work. One of the things that initially attracted me to design is how open-ended it is. Like you can sort of use anything to inspire your work, I think. Um, and in spite of that open-endedness, I often find myself surrounded by like design things all the time instead of being inspired by things outside of it. And I think it leads to this really disproportional relationship. If we think of design as this big red circle and kind of other fields as this smaller white one, I think it's really easy a lot of times as designers to focus on design to the exclusion of other disciplines. And really, the relationship should be more like this. If design is this red circle, it's sort of one of many fields that are worth uh, exploring, I think. And I think the more that we explore other areas, the more informed our work can be. So this talk is a little bit about that. 
If you've ever searched for something on the internet, and then like 30 minutes later you look up and you're on a completely different thing from what you started out from, then you're familiar with the concept of wormholes. Um, and I think as we explore other areas, it's really easy to fall into great wormholes where one discovery leads to the next and the next. And I really love that idea. I think the wormholes are everywhere and that it should be part of our job as designers to fall into them. And I think that wormholes can be both online and offline. So I think books, life experiences, people, and exploring other fields can all sort of lead to delightful discovery after discovery. So starting with architecture. I think since early times, people have looked to architecture for shelter and protection. It's part of our visual culture, part of our aesthetic culture. I think architecture is everywhere, and it forms the environments that we live in, we eat in, work in, and rest in. If you look at great examples of architecture from around the world, like the Great Pyramids in Egypt, the Taj Mahal in India, the Sydney Opera House in Australia, the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, and the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, I think we can see that architecture simultaneously reminds us of our history while also inspiring our future. So in order to achieve forms like the ones we just saw, architects combine lots of elements to visualize ideas. And I think the same is true for designers. Whether you're designing a, a skyscraper or a printed book, um, the interplay between elements like form and line, balance and contrast, symmetry, economy, variety, rhythm, these things are all important for both designers and architects. So the earliest surviving written work on architecture uh, is a treatise by the ancient Roman architect Vitruvius, which was written in the first century AD. And he named these three things as key elements of architecture, firmitas, utilitas, and minustas, which roughly translate to durability, utility, and beauty. Durability meaning that a building should stand up robustly and that it should remain in good condition. Utility meaning that it should function well for the people who use it. And beauty meaning that it should delight people and raise their spirits. And I think from the first century AD till now, not much has changed that these ancient principles um, of durability, utility, and beauty are things that we still seek in our work as creatives today. So the Swiss designer, Josef Muller Brockman, uh, said that use of the grid implies the will to achieve architectural dominion over both surface and space. And I think a grid can be more than just invisible lines. The concept that we get from architecture is one of supreme order and structure. I think grids manifest themselves through physical artifacts, both for architects and for us. Just like wood and stone, design is a building material that gives structure to things. So architecture is complex. It involves planning, designing, scheduling, construction, and lots of other moving parts. And design is also complex. It combines words, images, numbers, charts, illustrations, and requires translating these things so that they add up to something more, something hopefully distinctive and useful. The British architecture critic Rowan Moore said that good architects should be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. And what he meant by that is that architects should meet their clients' needs by designing well-made and sustainable buildings, but also they should add something in addition to that, um, to, the, to a setting, by working with the surroundings to create something more harmonious and pleasurable than it was before. And I think designers should uh, sort of use the same principle, that we should go beyond just filling a brief for our clients, and we should try to add something extra, something that makes uh, the work more pleasurable, more harmonious than it was before. Architecture is social. It encourages interaction and use. If we think about a space like this, we can kind of understand that concept of architecture encouraging interaction. And I think design functions in much the same way. It's social. It encourages interaction. So architecture is concerned with spaces, both positive spaces and negative spaces, and activating those spaces in different ways. And I think design shares the same concern. We focus on the space between things, like letters, columns, and lines. And we focus on the space inside things and around things. And finally, architecture is ubiquitous, it's everywhere. And I think design's everywhere too. Design's on the streets, it's on our walls, in our wallets, our clothes, uh, in our trash. We see design just everywhere. And I think it's really easy to be overwhelmed by all the things we see in visual culture. And Lebius Woods, the late American architect and artist, said that it's crucial that we invent strategies for seeing the familiar differently. And maybe that looks different for everyone, the seeing differently the things around us. Maybe it means collaborating with other people to keep your work fresh. Maybe it means regularly stepping back to take stock of your work and your process to keep things fresh. So I think it's important that we find new ways of seeing to avoid stagnation and creative burnout. So architecture is structure. It's concerned with giving form to things. 
It's complex. It requires many moving parts to achieve a final outcome. It's utilitarian, meaning that it's useful and functional in a practical way. It's social. It encourages interaction. And it's ubiquitous, meaning that it's a big part of our visual culture. And I think that design is all of these things. So moving on to filmmaking, I'm sure we've all heard that we should tell stories in our work and provide an engaging narrative for our clients and for other people that interact with the work. So filmmaking involves lots of stages, including an initial story idea, screenwriting, casting, shooting, editing, and finally screening the film. And the writer and filmmaker Adam Harrison Levy says that you need to have the eye of a painter, the ear of a composer, the story sense of a writer, and the ruthlessness of a commodities trader to be a top-notch film editor. And I think that these ideas about the way that we edit things and see things apply to design as well. A good designer sees like a painter, hears like a composer, has the narrative control of a writer, and isn't afraid to get rid of things that aren't working. The legendary film director Stanley Kubrick was known to be obsessive in his process of making movies. Once when he was asked how much time uh, he'd spend planning before starting to shoot a scene, he said, I think about a film almost continuously, as many hours as there are in the day and days in the week. So, in spite of that obsession over his work, he regularly would change things up on set. Even though you would think he would have everything figured out, he still changed things up on set pretty often. So I think it's okay that we obsess over our work as designers, but we shouldn't pretend that we have everything figured out. I think it's important that we remain open and adaptable in our approach to our work. In writing about Kubrick's work, uh, the British director and writer Christopher Nolan said that with Kubrick, there's great trust in one correct image to calmly explain something to the audience. So we'll take a look quickly at a couple of uh, cinemagraphs from Stanley Kubrick's work, showing his use of powerful, arresting images. And as we watch these, think about what they make you feel, what Kubrick might have been thinking when he made them. These are from The Shining. Hopefully they play. There we go. Just really simple, powerful visuals. This is Full Metal Jacket. A Clockwork Orange. Kind of creepy. <laughs> and these from 2001 A Space Odyssey. It's from the beginning of the movie and then near the end, this one. So I think this kind of powerful image making that we see in Kubrick's work is something for us to work towards in our own work. Um, I think both making powerful images and then also having the confidence that Kubrick had that those images will connect with our audiences is really important. So any good filmmaker will tell you that it isn't about process, but it's about the concept. It's about the idea of a film. Either it works or it doesn't. And I think you could also insert designer uh, into that phrase. Any good designer will tell you that it isn't about process, but it's about concept. Either the idea works or it doesn't work. And a good story is really important in filmmaking. For design, it's just as important. You have to lay out visual cues for your audience as you tell a story to show that things are connected and that they have purpose and meaning. So usually in filmmaking, if a story still works without a scene, it gets cut. So we need to be smart editors in the same way of the things that are in our work. The Danish film director, Nicholas Wining Refn, said, uh, I think he's probably best known for directing Drive, ladies. <laughs> he uses this concept of organic screenwriting in his work, which means that he assembles his films not as whole stories, but as individual associated images, and then he eventually juxtaposes those images together to make his films. So I think sometimes breaking our work down to its smallest parts and reassembling it proves a great way to get started or work through issues that we're having. I think we can find our work through its pieces, break and assemble. And finally, I think like great actors, as designers, we attempt to inhabit the character or the story of a brand or a client and fill those stories with personality, wit, and levity. So designing is a kind of acting. So filmmaking is story. It's providing an engaging narrative. It's concept. It's a purposeful idea that works. It's editing, so it's removing things that don't work and adding things that do work. It's obsession, which means it's deeply cared for. And it's acting, it's telling a story by inhabiting a character. So filmmaking is all these things, and I think design is also all of these things.
Moving on to food, probably my favorite section, especially because I'm really hungry right now. <laughs> there are lots of aspects to food culture. The ingredients in their preparation, the cooking process, the design of the kitchen and the objects in it, and then finally the serving of food and the enjoyment of food. And since ancient times, people have gathered around food, not only for sustenance, but also to share ideas. Our tools have evolved since ancient times. The ways that we prepare food, present food, consume food, have all changed in different ways, but the basic act of eating is the same as it was thousands of years ago. And that exchange of ideas, that community aspect of food, I think is really key. If we think about how many times we've already gathered around food uh, this weekend, we can see that community aspect. So food has power. It has power to bring people together around ideas. And I think with design and creativity, there's the same power to bring people together around ideas. So both food and design can help build community. As communities gather around ideas, consensus can be formed uh, and ideas can be elevated. Understanding the power of community is really key, I think, for us in a world with so many networks, both online and offline. So to work with food is to have an instant connection with people's memories, tastes, and feelings. Food has an ability to connect with people in deeply personal ways. Maybe a certain taste or smell reminds you of home or reminds you of childhood. And I think design also has this ability to have an instant connection to people's memories, tastes, and feelings. So working with food is the combination of many parts to make a harmonized whole, something that tastes good. And design is much the same. It's a lot of bits and pieces working together to form new combinations of things. Another interesting thing about food is unlike other things that we consume in our daily culture, uh, food actually goes into our bodies. We internalize food and we live with it. And I think good design is much the same. Uh, it can hit us here in the head and in the heart, and we internalize good design. We live with it. Maybe not in an explicitly physical way like eating, but we digest design in a very real way, nonetheless. So we eat for nourishment. Without eating, we would wither away. And I think creativity and design are the same. They're vital. Without them, we'd wither away. We're nourished by them. And I think it's hard to discuss food without thinking about the vessels that food is served in. How does it change a meal if we eat it on fine china versus a paper plate, for example? So think about the vessels that hold design. What are the physical artifacts of design? I think just important as the work we create is how we serve it to our audiences. And there's this notion of provenance in food, where something comes from. It's become really important. So definitely back home in Brooklyn, and I'm sure around the country, people are expecting transparency and honesty these days about the origin of goods and ingredients, about where their food comes from. And I think this hints at the idea of transparency and honesty in design, the notion of provenance. And that can take many forms. Maybe it means being more open about your process with your audiences and clients. Maybe it means carefully selecting the people that you work with to make sure that their values align with yours. So it's important for us to be transparent and honest in our work. And finally, this uh, from the French designer Philippe Stark. Uh, he thinks that in the future, we'll no longer need furniture for eating, that food will always be consumed during movement, during action. He says the idea to stop and sit around a table will be obsolete in the next generation. So that makes me wonder what notions we'll have to let go of as designers as we look to the future. What is the furniture that we'll no longer need? So food is community. It's gathering people around ideas and sharing. It's personal. It connects with people in different ways. It's consumed. We internalize it. It's nourishing. We're fed by food and sustained by it. And it's harmony, it's finding balance among many ingredients. And I think design is all of these things as well. I think you're probably seeing a pattern now. <laughs> so anthropology, we'll look a little bit about how culture and context are important for creative people. So as designers work with and for a wide range of people around the world these days, I think the knowledge and skills of anthropology are increasingly relevant for us. So anthropology comes from these two root words, anthropos and logos, these Greek root words. Anthropos meaning uh, human or, or man, uh, and logos meaning study. So it's the study of man or the study of human beings. And I think anthropology is different from other areas that study people as well, like psychology, for example, for a few reasons. For one thing, it's transcultural, so it looks at all human groups. For another thing, it spans human history from ancient times to modern times. Uh, and then it's also holistic, so it looks at how different cultures are linked together and how they affect people. And I think it's an important area because nothing exists in isolation. Design divorced from the context in which the end product is used is of little value to its audience. 
So we have to consider the environment, the culture, and the situation as part of our design process. Who are we designing for? How will it be used? And I think anthropology gives us uh, a tool set for finding these contexts. So these are all basic tenets of anthropology. Observe, collect, document, analyze, and compare. And I think these are similar skills that designers use in our work. So anthropologists are taught that everything is interesting to look closer. They look at our history, our evolution, and our relationships. And I think one observation that immediately comes to mind when I think of our current culture uh, is the digital realm. We're surrounded by these little glowing rectangles all day long, right? These digital devices. So how have these things changed culture? How have they changed the way that we live? Is culture being slowly dematerialized by the shift from analog to digital? I think these are really interesting questions for both designers and anthropologists. The anthropologist Margaret Mead said that if we are to achieve a richer culture, rich in contrasting values, we must recognize the whole gamut of human potentialities. And so we weave a less arbitrary social fabric, one in which each diverse human gift will find a fitting place. So from this, I think we learned that um, Observing and recording culture makes it richer. And I think design is very much about those things. It's about observing and recording culture. So while observing culture, anthropologists make connections between culture and artifacts. They pay attention to edicts, which is the structure, a structure or environment as perceived by someone inside that structure or environment, and then imex, which is an outsider perception of that same uh, structure or environment. And I think this gets at the idea of appropriateness in design, that we should be really, really careful about how we make things and how they'll be interpreted by different groups of people. So it's important that we make connections and gather cultural artifacts, whether analog, digital, or oral. These artifacts give us a sense of context. We gain a deeper understanding of ourselves by having artifacts as a frame of reference. Anthropology is sensory, so it's a process that demands, or demands open-mindedness in the way that you look and listen. And I think this openness is a trait of both great anthropologists and great designers. Often design works as a trigger for the senses. So the things we learn from observing, from making connections, from collecting artifacts, these things allow us to have better dialogues, I think, with each other and the people that we're working for. So anthropology is connections. It's about discovering the relationships between things. It's interpreting. It's about explaining meaning and contexts. It's sensory, meaning it requires open eyes and open ears. It's observation, it's about seeing carefully. And it's dialogue, it's about creating conversation around culture. And I think design is also all of these things. I think ultimately we can make work that's more relevant, more meaningful, and more socially responsive by looking closer at this field. And finally, in the little bit of time we have left, we'll look at music, and in particular jazz and improvisation a little bit, and how those ideas relate to design. So a great simple analogy to understanding jazz improvisation, which is just composing music on the spot in your head, something that's not composed ahead of time, uh, a great analogy to that is your spontaneous speech. So if you think about how you're able to speak a sequence of sentences just on the spot in an everyday conversation without rehearsing those ahead of time, you kind of understand the basics of jazz improvisation. So what's happening during improvisation? I think there are three key things going on. There's knowledge of the work of harmonic theory, a deep familiarity with what older players have done, and then you add something personal on top of that. And I think that's similar to the design process. We work from a base of knowledge, we become familiar with the work of others that have come before us and our contemporaries, and then we add our own ideas on top of that. The great jazz piano player and improviser Keith Jarrett was asked about his approach to improvisation once, and he said that music doesn't come from music. It's like saying babies come from babies, it's not true. So he was talking about being inspired by things outside of music. And I think in the same way, design doesn't come from design. It comes from everything else. So musicians can improve just by listening to music. They don't have to have an instrument in hand to improve their skills. It's about listening carefully. And I think we don't have to be seated in front of computers uh, to get better at design. It's about absorbing the things around us. I think as long as our minds are open uh, and we're focused on improving, we can do that anywhere. So trading fours, this is an improvisational technique in which solos alternate for four measures. So I play four measures, you play four measures, I play four, you play four, and so on. It's a collective story that works best when you build on the work of others. You're informed by other people's work and that prompts your own response. So trading fours is a collaboration, it's conversation. 
And I think as designers, we trade floors all the time with our audiences, right? So we introduce things that then our audiences are invited to interpret and in their own ways. It's a feedback loop, it's improvisation. So Liz Danzico, a noted author and designer, wrote about this and she says that as designers, we write the notes and our audience improvise the music. So improvisation is a two-way street and I think design's also a two-way street. We can engage in design by making work, but then the people that interact with our work, our audiences and clients, also improvise with their reactions and their response and they also engage in improvisation. So jazz solo has contrast, right? It's not just a string of 16th notes over and over and over again. There's usually nuance to it. it maybe it starts out soft, then it builds in complexity and intensity, and then it comes back down again. So I think in our work, it's important uh, that we avoid repetition and we find contrast, that we find the nuances that make our work better. So there's a lot of freedom in jazz improvisation, right? You're just playing off the top of your head and nothing's composed but that's rooted and balanced by countless hours of practicing scales and patterns. And I think that we become better improvisers by putting in hard work. Actually, hard work frees us in the same way uh, that hard work frees jazz musicians. So practice leads to freedom. It's a point of departure. In the words of jazz legend Charlie Parker, he says, you practice, practice, practice. And then when you get up there on the bandstand, you forget all that, and you just wail. And I think that kind of freedom comes from having a solid foundation of skills. So music is conversation. It's a collective story. It's improvisation, so it's a natural and unrehearsed response. It's contrast, it's about nuance. It's listening, so it's focusing with an open mind. And it's about collaboration, it's about working together to tell a collective story. And I think design is all of these things. So back to this list from the beginning of the talk. Um, we briefly looked at architecture, filmmaking, food, anthropology, and music. And taking each one of those things in turn, I think as designers, we're, we are builders. We use the tools of design to make things. We're also storytellers. We weave engaging narratives for our clients and ourselves. We're cooks. We combine ingredients to make good work and we pay close attention to the vessels that it's served in. Uh, we're observers of each other and of culture and that informs our work. And then finally, we're improvisers. So we make melodies that we then play to our audiences and then they respond to that in turn. Uh, so as we engage in this field work, as we do this vital cultural research and are informed by it, let's keep in mind this one last thing, that what we make makes us. That's my time. Thanks so much for listening.